Okay, folks, I think we'll, uh, we'll start this session. Um, a very interesting panel, and, and first of all, I should thank, thanks to all the panelists for coming along. Um, it's really good to see you all. Um, I'll just briefly introduce uh, the panel members, and then I'll ask to say, them to say something about themselves and their relationship with live music, um, and some of uh, a few other questions uh, um, that we'd like to ask people. So, uh, on my left eye, and of course, this being a kind of music industry panel, it's hard to really pigeonhole people into doing just one thing, so you can't have... I know everyone on this panel will be wearing various hats, so uh, on my uh, far left is uh, Whiskers, who uh, uh, is also a member of the band uh, Forward Russia and has run record labels and so on, and currently works at Lead Met. Uh, on my uh, near left is Ben Kirby, who is manager of the Subways. On my right, uh, Nick Simlick, who's from Dead Young Records and a man called Porto. Um, and uh, I think most people know Simon Fifth on my far right. Nice to see Simon on the far right. Impressive fact. Celebration bonds is victory. Um, Simon, I think I will start with Simon actually, um, uh, because I, I would like him just to, to say just a couple of um, things about how, how they're involved in live music and, and reflect upon their experiences in live music and the issues at the moment. So, uh, but I thought it might also be useful to, for Simon to say something about how we started working together and how the, this kind of, kind of project that we have now has, has emerged. Um, well, in one sense, I have no involvement in live music whatsoever compared with everybody else on the panel. But in another sense, I've been I'm only sitting here doing what I do because from a very early age, I got obsessed with going to live music. Um, and it culminated when I was a rock critic for the Sunday Times for about I've been observed for about 10 years. And in that period, I probably went to three or four gigs a week, um, which was quite a funny, when I look back on it, it's quite a strange experience in some ways, but it did confirm to me something that I've always thought academically, which is to experience music live is the way you have to experience music. And for all the dominance of records and that kind of record and all the other things, there's something about live music that is transcendently different about any other sort of musical experience. And that is kind of significant and remains significant despite everything. Um, so I've always had that sort of commitment to live music. And there's two other things I wanted to say which might sound really relevant but not. One is I was really fascinated by the paper we had today about improvised music because I'm the brother of a free improvising musician. And I have had some interest in following his career and how you make money when you make that sort of music, which I could talk to you about if you wanted to. But again, it's interesting for me that, and the only reason I mention that scene is because it's a scene which, although he makes money out of selling records, it's not a scene, it's about playing live. It's about having an endless series of engagements with other people in a live situation. And how you can manage and sustain that is actually quite, it's not, it's not just economically, I think it's emotionally. <coughs> Physically, how you maintain that is a very interesting question, something I've often talked about. I mean, anybody here who's been in a band on a long tour knows that there are other issues that come up about the things you have to go through in order to have these moments which make it all worthwhile. So I think there are a whole lot of, well, live music has always been <coughs> fascinating me for that reason. I, so that's one strand. The other strand related to the other thing that Martin talked about is that quite early on in my academic career, I started working, I never was particularly interested in just doing academic work, and I started working. Um, in kind of policy areas, so one of the very earliest research projects I got involved in in the 70s in Coventry was a research project on what young people called was about the use of the city centre and live music in the city centre. And it was particularly because it was being funded by a charity with these interests. What people were, the charity was actually interested in was how drugs were being involved in young people's use of the city centre. But and we actually got much more interested in how music was involved in young people's use of the city centre, which was actually much more significant. I mean, drugs are relevant, but they weren't central to defining where people went and why they went there and what they went there for. Um, so I've, from very early on, I got involved, got involved in thinking about how important it is for a city that's going to have any sort of, what I think of as human life, to be a city in which it's possible for people to have a lot of different live music experiences. And that has to become central to what any good city policy is about. Um, but in the 70s and 80s, and you can see some aspects of this in Leeds, particularly true in Coventry, a lot of what was going on in the way of kind of redevelopment of city centres was actually having the effect of driving people out in the places that were too expensive to go to develop a certain sort of commercial leisure. So it became interesting to me how you could sustain spaces, whether they were pop <coughs> rooms or youth clubs or 
art centres and which different sorts of, of, of <coughs> what they were talking about this morning kind of means of making music that you didn't know what was going to happen could still go on happening. And, ha and so I did get interested in, uh, for a while there was a, there were a lot of musicians collectors around at the time and I chaired an organisation of musicians collectors which we met in Sheffield and there were kind of young musicians from all over the country trying to work out. And it was really about how you could actually generate income from, from local, where you could get money from, to, not to make music, but to provide a place where that music could be made. So when I first went to Scotland, I, would, I obviously wanted to go on being involved in thinking about those sorts of policies, and that's really how I met Martin, from a kind of different route, but also got involved in thinking about how as an academic you could get involved in trying to influence the sorts of decisions that people made, particularly in cities, about musical spaces. So, so just to summarise, so I've never had any, I've never ever been any sort of musician, played any instrument beyond grade two on piano, but I grew up with musicians, and I've kind of lived with music all my life, and I still think that live music is where it's at. So, that's it. Thank you, Simon. Um, I'm going to hold the floor and, and go second, but before we get into the more interesting people. Um, <laughs> and grade two piano is pretty accomplished to, compared to my musical ability. Um, my kind of interest in all this started with, with a report that I did with Simon and a guy called John Williamson um, back in 2002 when we were asked to do a mapping exercise of the music industry in Scotland. And one of the things we found in that report, Scotland has none of the major record companies uh, present there, of course, um, but we found that people spent more money going to gigs than they did on buying records in Scotland. And that's about 10 years ago, and that's a, a trend which has, has since become kind of UK-wide. Uh, we were also working at a time where most academic research that on the music, or what's called the music industry, um, had been entirely dominated by accounts of the major record companies, and no one had really done much on, on the live music industry. Uh, so, cut a very long story short, Simon and I put a bid together to the HRC, which resulted in a three-year project, um, which was uh, where we kind of traced the, the history and culture and uh, political economy, I guess, of, of the live music industry in the UK. Uh, across all genres, across a 60-year period, so it's just a, a wee little project, and we're currently writing uh, three books, um, the first of which, as Simon said yesterday, has just gone off to the publishers. Uh, coinciding with that, uh, I got invited to get involved more directly, I guess, in the music industry when uh, Matt Brennan's band, Zoe Van Gogh, uh, invited me to become their manager. Um, despite my turning it down several times, I ended up doing it. Um, <laughs> Yeah, they were persistent. Uh, <laughs> I, I was weak-willed. Um, <laughs> that involved uh, a, a few things, including uh, kind of negotiating a record co uh, contract with a, a Glasgow-based label called Chemical Underground. Uh, but it also involved me much, much more directly dealing with promoters across the UK and trying to, to get gigs and so on, and I can copy Paul for Scotland on that. Um, and that, that's kind of an ongoing process. But currently, um, Simon and I are both on. Um, <coughs> a uh, steering committee for a report that's being done by Creative Scotland on mapping the music industry in Scotland ten years after we, 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 we did it. And uh, I think it's already apparent that um, the live sector will be much more at the forefront of that report than I think it was our report kind of ten years ago. Um, so that's how my involvement came about and I guess um, I'm still really fascinated particularly by the, by the role of the state in live music, both as a kind of regulator mm -hmm. but also as a promoter, it kind of has this dual role and I think um, I was, ref was just reflecting with Simon, I think there's been a lot of talk about the state over the last couple of days about public money. I think it's very interesting, and I, I wonder whether that's a kind of academic bias and if we'd had a kind of music industry conference, no one would be talking about government or things like that. Anyway, so that's, that's my kind of background, but I'll, I'll maybe pass over to Whiskers to say a little bit about his background and how you know, kind of interest in live music. Yeah, um, I, I guess somewhere I've always um, been into live music as a, as a fan and then as a and, and then aspirationally, I suppose, and wanted to get in, get involved. Um, I always say stories. I, I grew up in Wakefield, and ten years ago in Wakefield, there really weren't any live venues where you could kind of rock up and play. Not not to the extent that kind of major uh, major cities do, like like in Leeds, where you can just go and, and ask a promoter to play a gig, and then if you're good enough, you'd get a gig. My background from the age of about sixteen was hiring backrooms of pubs and finding PA's and getting my mates down, which I think is kind of something that's informed everything I've done along the way. So when I've moved to Leeds and have kind of you know sustainable venues that I still had an attitude of if well why don't I just bring someone who owns a PA and get my mates back 
want to play and get all my friends friends down. Which I think what I've what I've discovered with people who've grown up in, in a larger city music scene like Leeds is that they don't they don't really realise that. They think the way to get your gig is to approach a gatekeeper, you know, like a promoter. Whereas I've never really had that in Wakefield. The gatekeeper was, you know, getting friendly and with a landlord of a pub who who you could persuade you were really 18 when you were actually 16. <laughs> and, um, or, and, and, and all your friends who were also only 16. But, you know, anyway. um, so, 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 so that's, that's my real background. Um, and then when I moved up to Leeds, I started like, working behind the bar at a venue called Joseph's Well, which for a long time, from about 10 to 5 years ago, was a real sort of crib, hub of bands in Leeds, with, with, from the hardcore scene to folk scene to international artists coming in and ended up with many people who went on to be in successful bands working behind the bar and being part of a part of a you know a scene down there. Um, and then after that I actually sort of I was encouraged to to take my interest in gigs further and in two thousand and three uh, I I ended up taking over the promotions of a city centre pub in Leeds called the Vine, which I would say if you find it don't go in. Uh, <laughs> um, that for two and a half years, it's, it's in the. Did you actually go yeah, to it? Yeah, we did it. Yeah, we <laughs> <laughs> did it. But, we had surfed in it as well. <laughs> for two and a half years, I think we did a damn good job of setting up. We pretty much set up from scratch a successful uh, venue. We, 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 we encouraged the landlords to help to let us build the stage, install a proper PA. We made sure that, as opposed to some other venues that weren't really set up, it had a professional staff running, oh well, on the back end, back room side of it had a professional staff running, unfortunately, same can't be said for the bar side of things. Um, but we had, you know, around that time, 2003, 4, 5, we had, uh, we were getting bands like Arctic Monkeys, I think played their second gig outside of Sheffield there, um, the Subways played their early days, Mystery Jets, the Noisettes, as well as kind of touring, like American bands and so on and so forth. Um, and eventually what happened was it kind of got to a point where the problems we were having with the bar side and the, the position of the venue like outweighed the joy we were getting from promoting. Um, and at that point, really, in terms of that side of me being involved in live music, my, my relationship ended. We, we, we left the venue. And part of the reason we did that was because the venue had a tie-in with a... We started a record label out of the scene of local bands that were playing at the venue. Um, we had a night called Transmission and we formed a record level off the back of it called Dance the Radio that started released, started with compilations of a scene of local bands that were all playing our venue and then went on to become quite established and released records by my band Forward Russia um, and, and sort of notably the Pigeon Detectives and Dance the Radio to this day is still based in Leeds, in fact it's currently based there I think, um, <laughs> there. Um, but although I'm, I'm no longer involved. But at that time, Forward Russia, sorry, I feel like I'm growing on a bit now, but with, uh, with Forward Russia, through the support of the record label we started and the backing we had, we went on to, site, to, to tour throughout Europe and America, so I then now had that appreciation of the live music scene. Uh, <laughs> doing, doing, we, and for a long time, we existed without an agent in the UK, and then we worked with agents from ITB, um, who, were, yeah, like I said, toured, plotted tours all around Europe, and to a large extent, Forward Russia's success that we had, was built entirely through uh, touring. Uh, first of all, the, the first tours we did you know, were entirely booked, uh, sleeping on people's floors, booking friends and connections, and a lot of connections that I built as a promoter, um, working at the Vine, and then a lot of people kind of repaying favours and so on and so forth and doing it for goodwill. And then we moved on to work with an agent, but we were lucky enough to work with an agent who was sympathetic to this, and quite often we tried to keep relationships that we'd built from the early days through, through our career, which, um, you know, which I think you know, really stood us in good stead. Um, and, and, and my involvement in the band and the label kind of went on until 2008, and then since then I've been mostly working with things like recording. I did a master's degree at Leeds Met in music production and uh, been involved in kind of advisory capacity to bands in a kind of mentoring level. And then at the start of this year, I actually got uh, got a job on staff at Leeds Met, where now, to be fair, I'm looking at the other side of everything. I'm looking at the way that digital is affecting the way people, you know, change, uh, go about creating fan bases and stuff. And it's very interesting to look at, at how much bands can create a fan base in the digital world as opposed to live, and also where bands have their priorities in nowadays. Do you know what I mean? I'm really coming back to that. Thank you very yeah. much. Do so for you. Um, You're better than that. Right, well, I started, like kind of most people I've met in the music industry, which is in a band who weren't very good. 
Uh, and I was at Edinburgh University and I kind of got dumb, uh, decided I wasn't really enjoying myself there and I went into uh, promoting uh, the, the, the band that wasn't being very successful so I started to sort of book uh, DJ acts, we, we book things like the Cuban Brothers, you know, the, mm -hmm. brothers the Cuban yeah. Brothers, the DJ outfit in a cafe which is just two guys who generally get their clothes off and dance around in the middle. Um, we eventually, I moved back to London, started a company called Apple Night Music with a friend of mine uh, called Phil Taylor which was uh, basically a, a small promotion company booking unsigned artists uh, throughout London. I was doing quite a lot of work on festivals in terms of community festivals and booking uh, small bands, unsigned artists, unsigned stage, just that kind of stuff uh, to try and, I suppose, create or find, or find new acts. Um, and eventually the, the subways kind of walked in and played as uh, they were kind of well in Garden City, which is outside of London, um, quite difficult to find uh, in constant gigs. They drifted into London, finally got themselves a gig at 15 years old um, and played illegally in, in the Buffalo Bar in London and were the best band I'd seen for a long, long time, and I watched uh, several well-established uh, sort of 30-year-old bands collapse as they saw tiny little people with instruments blowing the place away. So it, it's my life kind of turned there. I, I, I took the band to my partner at the time and said, "Listen, I want to manage this act. I think we should manage this act." And he uh, said no, and I quit and started uh, a company called Good Music Management. Uh, which I've now worked with the Subways for about eight years um, and we've, they've fast become an internationally known act. Um, mostly uh, live is their, their forte, like this, where they really excel, they play festivals throughout, uh, throughout the world and um, can entertain any crowd in any room, um, which has uh, become incredibly important, I think. From, I've now taken on another act called uh, Young Aviators, who are based in, in Glasgow, uh, another act in France called uh, The Dancers, um, and it's becoming more and more apparent just how important live music is. I think I always, when I started, I, I, I never really bought that many records. I always bought gig tickets, my big thing was going out. I was lucky, that, I suppose, in a way that I was brought up in London. I had a choice of venues I could I could attend, and um, I had international acts coming in and playing. Um, so I did have the opportunity to go out and, and watch a lot of these uh, a lot of these acts. And I never didn't actually buy that many records. My record collection is not that huge. <coughs> My boy is here, luckily, so I could just borrow all of him. Um, but that, in a way, has become incredibly important because that trend seems to have expanded to the entire world, and that no one buys records now. <laughs> so live music has become uh, more and more important, and the ability to sort of enter, uh, for, for, you know, for my genre in terms of what I do is rock, or rock and pop and sort of live, so I try to concentrate on bands who can uh, kind of entertain a live crowd and, and sell some ticket and sell some tickets. Um, I've recently, like I say, taken on a band called The, the Dancers, um, they're based out of France, and I'm finding it quite fascinating the way the system in France works to support um, acts and is incredibly different from that in the UK um, and that there's a lot more uh, support from, the, from local authority and government to, to support and pay for up and coming artists and it receives a mixed, uh, I suppose a mixed review from, from, from promoters and those who are actually booking the artists and sending them around the country. Um, some very for it in terms, uh, in terms of it supporting the artists and, and over a long period of time allowing them to develop. Uh, there are others who think that it's just a huge waste of money because it's giving money to bands who really are kind of average and don't therefore have the, the fight against the, to the system such in the UK where you really just get, <coughs> when you're starting up a slap in the face and maybe some water and in London you have to pay to play. Um, so it's, it's, uh, you really need to fight hard to, to, to be successful. Um, and in France I think there's, a, there's, there's this huge support but at the same time as perhaps. Perhaps uh, not that uh, sort of education of how you need how you, I think they get quite a shock when it comes to the UK. And <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, so, so. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I came up music from a, well, I always stumbled into it. Really, I've never been a musician. I've never played in a band. I've never well. I think 
you beat me again with the great <laughs> piano. I think I dropped out of grade one for some reason, such a thing. Um, but whilst at university in Sheffield, um, I found myself getting more and more drawn away from my incredibly tedious degree of economics and but applying my degree of economics in order to um, find something else to do um, by not having any money but wanting to get to gigs and wanting to have records and wanting to enjoy that side of life. I also ended up volunteering to help out at local venues and do things for local bands in order to get in free. So I ended up working the door, ended up doing merch, I ended up walking around collecting mailing lists in exchange for badges, lots of other things which I know a lot of people thought was ridiculous and they, they wouldn't even consider doing it but for me to get into a gig that was maybe sold out or you know just <coughs> to, get to see a band that I was interested in and didn't have the money to spend on made an awful lot of sense and I don't know if I was good at it or I was just enthusiastic but it sort of spiralled very quickly into me working for Island Records and various numbers of their subsidiaries while still at university um, and doing a lot, looking after a lot of their bands when they came to the city of Sheffield um, and that, uh, as soon as I finished university, led to me working for them full time, doing all of those things and assisting tour managers on the road, um, and going all around Europe, um, looking after the more promotional side of what bands did. So looking after <coughs> interviews and radio sessions and after parties and everything that wasn't the gig, like the nuts and bolts, everything that sort of came onto that that would actually help promote the band more in the city to people who weren't necessarily going to the gig. And I found that very interesting, but it wasn't necessarily where my heart lay. So a job came up at Sheffield University where I'd been studying um, to work as a promotion assistant in the Students' Union, um, helping out with their, their very, at the time, very, very established live music night, which was the, the Fuzz Club. Um, which was one of the best sort of indie pop nights in the country um, and there was no real competition from Big Ben. The only other place that was putting on music of a live variety of any notes was the Lead Mill. There was no academy venue, there was no other venues like that uh, and they had the Octagon which wasn't an ideal venue, it was a multi-purpose sports hall with bleachers and no real character to it apart from the fact that it was octagonally shaped. Um, <laughs> really a, that odd for it. Um, but I relished working there and worked more and more in the live music side of things until the academy opened there um, and the head of live music there, um, she got very disenfranchised with it um, and the atmosphere moment was changed from that and I got put on to working with DJs and clubs and pop music and the bread and butter of a students union which is, you know, helping kids to cop off whilst drinking cheap booze sort of thing, <laughs> um, which was very much not mm -hmm. what I wanted to do. Um, so I ended up jumping ship, moving to Leeds with a friend of mine who had worked at the university, who had started a record label over here called Edging Records, um, and that very much felt like where my heart lay. He was going to do the, the record pressing side of things, and I was going to do the live promotion side of things and looking after the tours and everything that came with the band. Um, and as part of that, we very much, we sort of put on showcases at a place called the Porto. Um, that was where we sort of, if we liked a band and we thought we might work with them, um, then we'd have to get them in for a live show. With One of our things was we'd never ever work with a band on the label if we hadn't seen them cut their teeth properly live. And it was a very, very important part for us, even if we were going to release their record and their recording sounded amazing, if they couldn't impress a crowd live, then we didn't feel that we could work with them. Um, and as part of that, um, we just ended up putting on shows in a Porto, and then eventually that's developed about three, four years down the line to me being the in-house live music manager at that venue, um, because they saw a lot of value in what we did. It brought down different people to the venue. It brought down sort of new faces who would appreciate the venue and the bar for being somewhere that you could go hang out, it had a bit of a scene about it, you know, people who work behind the bar were also people who were playing on stage, like Whiskers said with the, uh, with the well um, back then. And I don't think it's anywhere near at that level, it's a much smaller place, but that's sort of how my involvement's been. And I've sort of moved more and more <coughs> away from the record label um, and into live music, and that's where my passion lies. It's the engagement between watching a band and a live audience and being involved in that, even though I don't have the ability to be the person on the stage, it's very fulfilling to know that 
all these people are here enjoying what they do, and you played a role in that. Thank you. Um, one of the things that we, we said yesterday that characterises live music is, of course, it has to take place somewhere. And that's uh, somewhere we're at the moment is Leeds, of course. And I just wonder whether people could give me some of their reflections about what's good about live music in Leeds at the moment, and maybe what's not quite so good. So I'll, I'll, I'll again start with Whiskers. How do you find the kind of live music scene in Leeds at the moment? Well, I think I think the thing about the, the, the live music scene in Leeds is it's always been dominated by by figures or groups of people. I suppose. I mean, in the mainstream now, you have things like Nathan. You I think it's just the, it's the Brunel. You have a big organisation like Future Sound who own the cockpit and run live at Leeds and Constellations Festivals. You have another character called um, Ash who used to run a venue called Faversham and now runs a venue called the Nation of Shop Creepers. And even Nick and everything that goes on at Porto. You have these groups and, and they're very sort of almost that individual and identifiable that there is, you know, it's not just faceless gigs in places. And that's definitely something that I think has changed because, well, not changed, it was, it's almost been refined. <laughs> I think, to the years, because I remember, you know, like eight years ago, there were a lot of venues where you would just walk into and you'd kind of sign email or sign a name and say, I want to play, and then you'd get an email or a phone call, you know, and, 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 and these would be arranged, whereas now it's, everything's very cura curatorial in a way, you know, it's very much like what a lot of it's what one people like, and it, even down to Future Sound, who are kind of the big, big promoters, the, the people who book the shows there, Simon and Andy, are very, you know, are familiar faces in the city you know, music fans who book music that they want. Um, but, but, but similarly, like, that's the mainstream, and you know, you go further than that into, into the punk rock scene, and, and, and I know, like, Nick, at a point, you do a lot of more folky stuff, but, but even, you know, true, true folky stuff, I think, again, it's, it's centred around nights, and, you know, nights and curators of a, of a certain music and scene. And, and again, it's this... I referred to gatekeepers earlier, and I mean, it's a completely different way, like people who were kind of taste makers for a scene, like putting on the gigs that they liked. And that only, the interesting thing I think is, when I started going to gigs in Leeds 10 years ago, that was only, I think, in the, in the, in, in the non-mainstream. You know, there were some great people, like 10 years ago, like Collective AKA, putting on great punk rock shows. And who, you, you know, you went to a Collective AKA gig because you knew what you were getting, and you, if you liked that scene, they were great gigs. But that didn't exist in the mainstream. They were just blanket gigs. Whereas now it's a flip. You know, you pretty much know what you're going to get from a gig at Nation of Shopkeepers. You pretty much know what you're going to get from a gig at Group Now. You know, within certain confines, obviously, you know, there are different genres, but you can associate with the individuals who are booking the gigs and kind of know what you're getting, which, which I think is, I think is a good thing. Really. And how do you, how do you find the lead scene? Well. I must admit, I'm not going to be an expert on these specifically. <laughs> um, um, I can just say, as, as an experience of coming through mm. with the subways on various tours which we've done, uh, they've obviously done uh, Leeds uh, Festival, in, as in Leeds and Reading Festival, uh, several times. And I've, I think, in terms of the, the, the fan bases which you, you, they've hit and the, the, the kind of uh, ferocity for, for live music, it seems to be really present in Leeds and there seems to be uh, a real kind of uh, excitement whenever the band come through, they really look forward to coming uh, to Leeds. This is the first time at the Leeds uh, uh, Leeds, Fest Leeds Life uh, Festival, so I'll tell you after tonight <laughs> <laughs> how, they, how it goes. They're doing the cockpits, they do come down. Um, it, it's, yeah, it's, for me, it's always been a, a, a definite point on the tour. We've done, I think, the cockpit several uh, several times. Brud Brudnell, I think, which is a bit newer. Um, and, on the last, was that, was that, was that 20 years old? I didn't know. Actually, you were doing these parts. Not an expert. I, I, I found, I can probably talk from a, a sort of a, year, a, a, like a UK based approach to uh, it, it. There seems to be um, obviously an academic turn, turn, turn down. Mm. There seems to be a drop in the amount of festivals and opportunities uh, there is available for, for acts to be playing. and. Obviously, people don't have as much money in their pocket at the moment to be able to, to, to go out and enjoy these festivals which are being put on. So, um, I, I think so, things like the, the live, uh, Leeds Live, the Leeds Festival, and all that kind of stuff, it's incredibly important to kind of just keep it, keep strong, keep strong. Keep going. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <coughs> Nick, what are your reflections on the scene? Um, Leeds at the moment? Well, I sort of come from it in a very sort of middle way about by mm. I sort of went to university in Sheffield and then worked there for a number of years afterwards. Um, and when the academy opened there and 
it sort of took away the scene that was at the university and places surrounding there. It very much felt like the Sheffield scene had just become a place where you went to the big rock gigs and it sort of killed off all the sort of middle ground promoters. Sheffield was a really weird place in terms of if you went to a folk gig, <laughs> I'll get on to Leeds, don't worry. <laughs> if, if you went to a folk gig, then the crowd would be the people who put on the dance nights, the people who put on the rock nights, and a few people who were into the folk music, because it was somewhere to go. Um, and I found myself coming more and more to shows in Leeds, because there was a lot more going on. And coming to Leeds, there is, it's, it just feels like it's a slightly bigger place. It's just, Sheffield wasn't big enough to sustain different scenes and have that, the different faces of the different scenes. Whereas in Leeds, you will find there's a crowd who goes to the acoustic and the folk music. There's a heavy rock crowd. There's, and you can go to those gigs and you can know that there's enough bands playing in that sort of scene in order to sustain lots of different enthusiasms and there will be a lot more diversity. Whereas a lot of other cities in the UK, I think, suffer from either having only one type of scene or they very much suffer from having no scene at all. So it's just people who are interested in music who have no real collective love of a certain thing. So nothing ever happens there on a grander scale. Whereas in Leeds, people are allowed to be encouraged and flourish and play on bills with the same sort of bands. And people will come up who are, you know, hold power in the music industry and they will sign one band and then that band can talk about other people who are in the scene. And and it's that, that sort of thing that happens in a lot of cities and the way they've got bands develop is by word of mouth. <laughs> yeah. And if there isn't people to talk about your band, then you don't find that you're going to get anywhere, really. Whereas Leeds has got that, I found that's what attracted me to, to being here. The word of mouth thing was interesting because Stuart L. Baker, so they said, you know, through Facebook you can, you can find out what people are doing word of mouth. <laughs> because you can find out what they're saying yeah. to their friends, so you so suddenly the big promoters can get the, the word of mouth thing and, and use it for their yeah. own ends. Make, make it more tangible sort of thing. Yeah, but. yeah, it's a yeah, slightly dystopian future, I think. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the things that, that, that kind of stopped me when, when Ben was talking was about government support and things like that. For, for I just wondered whether um, some of you could reflect for, perhaps on um, instances where the state has been helpful to you uh, in terms of public support or instances where you know um, regulation and things have been a bit of, bit of a hassle so um, Ben you I mean uh, maybe you could say a little bit more, more about you know how you think it's helping in France or, or, you know, or okay. perhaps reflections on your work with the subways. Okay well, I think I think with the, with the, with the subways we've never really and uh, I think we've never really approached it in, in, in terms of things they, they got quite um, heavy support from a record label pretty quickly, um, which has meant that they've been able to, to promote and to, to operate on a live basis. They went, they got tour supported for, uh, for, for things like going to the US or going to Japan, um, and even some ventures into Europe, and uh, that was kind of done privately through uh, being signed to Warner as, as, as an international artist. Um, I, my recent experience when I'm still, I'm still trying to kind of get fully determined with the system in France. Um, as, a, as an example, our tour manager, um, who's been who's tour managed many bands over uh, many, many years, um, very experienced man, and he still doesn't understand the settlement sheet from in, in any venue in France. You can pick it up and you look through it and you have no idea where the ins and outs are coming from. Um, the, the system seems to work that if the band is picked up by a promoter and is represented by a promoter um, he's, as a national um, artist, you uh, each member of the band is waged rather than um, sort of paid for by fees from venues. So they they get I think it's 130 euros per person for for band members plus a technician um, if needed plus support in terms of uh, across uh, across the board support for for transportation for uh, backline hire anything which you need to sort of sustain yourself on the road. Um, and that becomes a recoupable amount of, uh, against the fees which are collected through the, through, the, through, uh, through the venue, through the performances. But the performance fees themselves for an up-and-coming band in France will be far in uh, excess of what you would, could achieve in the UK. Uh, the UK support band, 50 quid, yeah. um, plus some beers. In France, full catering, <laughs> 700 euros sometimes for an up-and-coming artist. 
um, you uh, are sort of well looked after. And like I say, there is that balance of like the struggling artists, which I sometimes sort of uh, argue that they need to be struggling a little bit more to, uh, to push themselves. Um, but they, on top of that, they get in this thing called an intermittence, which is a almost uh, benefit from the government. They do 50 shows a year at 10, 10 hours per show, and they can get on another, I think it's 60 euros a week on top of what they're earning per person um, to they're again sustain themselves as, as an artist, as a musician. There is that kind of internal um, kind of workings in France which seems to, to heavily support live music. There's a lot of venues which are, <coughs> uh, have been created, which the local one to them is called, the, uh, to, to the dancers, is called the Sh uh, Shabada, and you walk in and there's, there's quite a, a huge amount of staff uh, looking after what is probably two, one or two shows a, a week and, and you know, all paid for very nice look, looking venues. Um, not sure where exactly all this money is coming from, I presume the taxpayer, but um, it's quite an impressive system. Like I say, I still, I don't, I'm still arguing with myself whether it's, the, you know, in terms of French artists coming through, there are some very good ones, and I do think it's speeding up, but if you look in the past, they're not known for bring, producing the vast amounts of rock musicians, well, for example. From, from my brief experience of touring in France, what st strikes me maybe is that more of the venues are whole centres, <coughs> centres yeah. for music, and per totally purpose-built. They're not, they're not like a bar with a back room or anything. A lot of, I remember going to a place called Angoulême, which is a mm -hmm. small place outside of Bordeaux or something, and we played, we support, is, it, is it Kill the Young? A Manchester yeah, band they've done quite well in, in, in France. In France. Yeah. yeah, so they were playing to a thousand, thousand people in, in, in Angoulême. You know, in a small in a small place, but we walked into this fantastically fully equipped music centre with a music library, that was yeah. a capacity venue, an upstairs restaurant, studio, full, yeah, full in. catering. You know, and those who are paid to just to stay to to stay in house and, and record bands when they come through, yeah. local areas, like, full, full lighting, you know, fully pitch. tech so, yeah. Yeah. There's strong relations in, in uh, Angers. There's relations to to Wigan in terms of that's strange uh, twin, but. In terms of swapping bands over, he's established a contact with South by Southwest in terms of uh, exchange of bands. There's quite a, a huge uh, network of things, which I, I, it is, it, yeah, it's impressive to, it's impressive to see. Yeah. I think we, because we, we ended up doing quite a large tour in France for, for what we were, I think we played like eight or nine dates in France within a European tour, mm -hmm. and I think probably two thirds of the venues were these all encompassing venues that were mm -hmm. kind of purpose, if not purpose built, purpose converted for their purpose, which you wouldn't, you know, there's, I remember somewhere like the Lemon Tree in Aberdeen is the near, is the, one of the closest examples I can think of in, 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 in Britain. Mm -hmm. yeah. Which was spectacularly bust. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> yes, exactly, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah it was an attempt to build that in Sheffield, of course. Yes. It also yeah. had the National Centre for Popular Music. Oh, yeah. 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 It was yeah. one of its problems. No, well, they tried to convert it into yeah. that afterwards. Yeah. That, it also didn't work for that. But I was thinking also the lead mill which you mentioned and yeah. red tape uh, studio complex and so on. Um, what about your experiences with perhaps of, of, of the state as either a kind of enabler or a preventer? Right? Um, my only real experience recently um, is with the venue that I work as the promoter in. Um, and I've very much been learning the nuts and bolts of it because when I went to the Students' Union there's a whole plethora of people who deal with all the different aspects of things, whereas this is a very small place where I have to do everything from booking the bands, getting the posters designed, to building the stage, and then stage managing on the night, so I still do all the aspects of it. Um, and they had, towards the beginning of last year, uh, a complaint from a resident above. Um, so my main uh, dealings with sort of the legal framework of music in that respect, live music side, um, has been noise abatement notices, soundproofing, <laughs> and, and lots of fun things like that, which was a fascinating read. Um, <laughs> but um, it, well, it was something which um, I was very interested in. It was very weird to learn things that um, a resident has preference over a venue up until if the venue's been established for 100 years, uh, which is presumably old English law. And then if a venue's been there for a hundred years, having live music or any sort of noise, then that venue then takes precedence initially in any argument mm. over a resident, which sort of makes sense in terms of 
if it's been there for 100 years, you can't really complain because it was there before you were born. So you moved into somewhere where you knew there was noise, um, which was sort of the argument we were trying to use at the time, was that this person was renting a flat in the very centre of the city, directly above one of the busiest bars in the city, which advertises that it has a 4am licence every night of the week. And then this person was complaining that there was noise and drinking and music. <laughs> when they lived <laughs> six <laughs> inches <laughs> the bottom of it. And this was a new person. Uh, yes, yeah, he was renting, he'd been in there for a few months. And he was, he was young, he was you know, mid to late 20s, and we tried to be reasonable with him. And that how, you, how were you dealt with it in terms of the, the how was that resolved? I mean, you, uh, it was supporting? resolved by if, no, we weren't supported at all. If, if anything, we were treated like criminals. Mm -hmm. um, Which is, but 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 this is, yeah. This is kind of you know experience of work and being in London. Like obviously, there's a lot of people living really closely, and you yeah. get a lot of these complaints from yeah. noises and stuff like that. And uh, my my friend runs uh, several venues. Uh, runs Buffalo Bar. Recently opened Lexington, um, and she's constantly battling, they're battling with those kind of noise yeah. things. And she, she uh, spent three four years looking for a new venue in London, trying to uh, to put bids on it. And she constantly was you know with the knowing that she had to be sound checking bands at say 2 o'clock in the afternoon, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, she wanted to attract international artists, she had to give them now and the time to be able to do that. Yeah. Um, and knowing that, that she's going to hit huge obstacles in terms of the noise levels that she's yeah. going to create and the amount of money she'd have to spend on one soundproofing, and if that doesn't quite work, you're still going to get these complaints yeah. from people for making some noise in the afternoon. It's incredibly difficult. Yeah. So I just wanted to butt in there, because um, one of the guys I interviewed in Bristol as part of my research, used to run a club called Native, and they had exactly the same problem. Um, the flats above them, well, the, the space above them was turned into flats, and suddenly they were like, they have been told to, you know, shut up. And what they ended up doing to get around this was they actually got their own people in to rent the flat. Uh, that's, that, well, we put in the soundproofing, which they required. We had to do that anyway, legally. We put in the soundproofing. Mm -hmm. We had to cancel um, almost all of our live music, apart from acoustic folk acts, which was never really going to cause a disturbance for a three-month period which caused a lot of problems, it upset a lot of agents, it, it burnt a few bridges for us and it also you know, lost us a lot of momentum and money because we still had to pay a lot of fees. Um, but then yeah, we, uh, two of the chefs from the company live there and two of the assistant managers live there now so we've sort of also you know, belt and braces on that one. Because it was such a drastic thing, it went literally from being, we had live music, everything was fine, uh, to being if you have a band above this decibel level and anything else is found then we can seize anything that makes noise in your entire venue including you know, the DJPA and anything that amplifies music and including bands equipment so it was you know a very shocking time for us and you know it was very aggressively done I think it could have been much more easily done by just starting a dialogue between us and the residents but it wasn't it was very much a here's a piece of paper You've been a naughty boy, sort of thing, and then this is what you have to do. I think that's part of the reflection of the last night, the 2003 license thing, and Bridget yeah. said one complaint was enough to. Yeah, but that's yeah. what that's I, know that, what it was. I, mean, I think it's one of those things that's worth campaigning for because I know that in, well, Martin probably knows the details better than me, but I know in Australia, yeah. this was a big battle, and they were stuck. Your 100 year rule is interesting because I think in Australia they've established in these well, one city, part of planning is that if you're an established venue, yeah. anybody who then applies for planning permission to build flats or Change the transform warehouses and flats. Yeah. They have to acknowledge that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and, and in Perth, as I understand it, they had a thing, the, the council had a thing called the Sound Attenu Attenuation Project, yeah. which um, one established the right of first, first occupants. So, you know, first occupants. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so yeah. If, if a venue moves in and starts making noise, that's a problem, but if it's a venue's already. The other thing it did was offer a mediation service as well, um, yeah. which is kind of an interesting yeah. thing. But, but I don't think any, anything like that's been done in the UK. Um, it's no, I mean, the, Australian. the people who've had the biggest problems, interestingly, are not clubs like you. It's clubs that wanted to put music on the, in the outdoor, put on something, but even an acoustic gig yeah. outside oh, sorry, in a yeah. sunny day in the summer. Yeah. And what instantly <laughs> goes down. Yeah. Um, I can see a couple of people who are signalling to that they would like to make comments or ask questions, and I'll, I'll, I'll take them and then I'll come back to the panel. Alison was signalling and then Tim. It was just it was again about Australia. I, was, um, I think Shane Heyman and Chris Gibson have done some work on uh, that in Sydney, and they found that uh, the people who would perhaps traditionally have uh, put on live music venues in were turning instead to gambling venues because and strip, stripping venues and stuff like that because there was this this was less noise complaints. But they were, that one of the things they suggested was that this is kind of. Um, it's a, it's a 
part of the kind of gentrifying um, spread through the <coughs> city as well, that certain areas, there's a kind of, it was always being used as a strategic thing, going to an area where there's a thriving live music scene and where there's going to be um, communities with like, young students and people with a bit of disposable income and then make a few noise complaints and turn the area into a kind of gentrified residential area. Yeah, that, that report's by um, Shane Hyman and Bruce Johnson, and it's a really good one, it's, it's called Vanishing Act. And uh, partly what happened in Australia was uh, in Sydney they, they relaxed their gambling laws, so it was easier to open casinos, <coughs> uh, and, and also the poker machines in pubs. Mm. So, so it's much, much, much easier to put in ten poker machine, gambling machines than it is to put on bands, so it's the venue stuff. The, but the upside of that was the key casinos, of course, also those places where musicians could play, so, so it, was, it, was a, you know, it, was, it was quite a complicated picture. Uh, I don't know whether you know the famous case in Birmingham with the rainbow, which has had music for a hundred years, yes. uh, uh, and that didn't matter. No. Um, uh, in, the, in the end, I think the settlement was satisfactory and the, and the rainbow still continues to put live music on, but it was exactly as Simon described, that they actually performed outside, and that was the basic problem, because the residential properties weren't close by at all, they were half a mile away. But there's, there's such an irony about that, isn't there, about reoccupying the city centre to make it more culturally vibrant, to enable the sort of cultural musical life that we're trying to talk about today. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, if there's one thing we ought to pick up for the state, it's about getting the bits of it together so that, yes, people can sleep at night, but yeah. that those are in balance with other important things that mm -hmm. we're trying to achieve. Well, there's a Brisbane model. Brisbane model, yeah. yeah. I mean, one of the questions then becomes, you know, do you have kind of designated entertainment areas where people know it's going to be noisy, or do you, or do you try and spread your venues across the city? Yeah, well, that's one of the Birmingham talking points as well, <coughs> and they have effectively done that, even if it's not a legislated or statu statutory. Well, I think what, what, what happened in Brisbane is my, my, my recollection is it, tend, it tended to be loads of cover bands, uh, venues, and very little space in the kind of entertainment zone for you know new. Original material like it. Um, I wanted to move, to move from these to the kind of broader picture at the moment and maybe invite to uh, comments on what, what you think the, the issues are at the moment, perhaps the opportunities and perhaps the kind of downside of music, which some of which Ben's alluded to. But Simon, perhaps looking from the outside, how do you see the, the, the kind of overall UK scene at the moment? What are the interesting issues? Mm, I find it very hard to articulate. I'd say that having been involved in thinking about this historically, I would say the first rule is that whatever happens in the world, people want to make and listen to music. So nothing can happen that's going to change that. So whatever goes on, there's going to be music going on. Um, so we can exaggerate the effects of economic state and everything else. I mean, people go and go and make music and want to make music. That said, um, as I said earlier on, the two key things that matter are accessible spaces and what I would say from what everybody said really, places when people can meet each other. Um, and so somebody talked very kind of eloquently about what a scene was, which I completely agree with, is where you can kind of get some sense of a kind of dynamic and a kind of commitment. And you've got to have places where that can happen. And I do wonder slightly about where those places are going to be. I mean, when I was growing up, one of the key places was a record shop. Um, and that's pretty well gone for that purpose, although it still exists in some places. Um, art centres can have that place, um, particular pubs, particular venues, the ones that you've talked about, student unions at certain times, but I kind of feel all those, all those spaces are always under, under some sort of threat. So one of the things I think is just going to be sustain, sustainable spaces in the context of other ways in which um, cities are changing. Another thing which we haven't talked about at all, which I think for me has been really striking in history, is that the absolutely central reason why people want to listen to music besides one person to it is because they want to dance to it. So the relationship between make, between one sort of musical event and dancing becomes very significant. And it's really interesting looking at the history of jazz clubs in the fifties. And the kind of tension between people who want to listen to jazz and people who want to dance to jazz and how that worked itself out in the way in which jazz clubs evolved and the development of what eventually became Rocky Blues Clubs was very much around a place where you could listen to jazz and dance to it becomes sort of significant. Whereas other sorts of jazz movies were essentially more like concert halls. Yeah. So, a space that's flexible enough to both listen and dance becomes extremely important if you're going to get people going out. And I think it's one of the interesting things with the improvised scene about whether you can dance and improvise music, which is and how that works. Is All those people listening to dubstep now, though. Pardon? All those people listening to dubstep. Right, yes, yeah, exactly. <laughs> this is the point I was going to do that yeah. the things that I'm doing, 
ways I'm looking at stuff is whether this place might be virtual. Yes. And, and, and this dancing, moment. if you're looking at modern music scenes and things like dubstep, yeah. they're being played on people's phones in yes. the park. Yeah. Yeah. You know, in, in, in a public know. space. Yeah. I think it's an interesting space. Yeah, it's so becoming, because so. the way dubstep are promoting themselves, and it was interesting what you were saying about the way the music is getting passed around, you know, dubstep are using lots of digital means, you know, like, like YouTube to upload content from, from, you know, like a, an aspiring dubstep artist aren't going to go and get gigs necessarily, and the reasons they're creating music. But yeah, but but they, yeah, it's not necessarily becoming a physical thing and a going out thing, it's it's on the bus, it's yeah, with it's your friends, constant. and it's constant, and, and you have things, the, the sharing of music is perhaps not happening, you know, in a, in a, in a, in a bar, in a youth club, o over a drink, it's happening on Facebook with a shared Spotify playlist. I'm still not sure that's going to get be able to involve musicians in quite the same sort of way. That's uh, but I think that's going to be the point as yeah. well. It, it probably won't do it um, the same way. But just, that's going to be interesting. The final thing I said, which I find very hard to articulate, because I'm, I'm not even altogether sure quite what I'm trying to argue, and it's often probably to do with nostalgia for the gigs I've loved and the places and the venues I've loved. It seems to me there's always a tension in live music, which is symbolised in one way by kind of free improvisation and another way by arguments about noise, funnily enough, which is the joy of live music is the joy of something not exactly uncontrollable, but unexpected. Mm. Whereas there seems to be a lot of the drive in the way live music venues develop is to make everything completely controllable. Um, and you know, that for me, you know, I'm very pleased that he's getting an arena. But when I hear about you know, what a wonderful venue the arena is going to be, I can see that, but it wouldn't be a venue I'd be excited to go to. Yeah. Because it wouldn't be the sort of musical experience. I mean, I can see, seeing a band I really love playing the fantastically good sound system is great. But that's not ultimately what I went to live music for. And I think it's that tension between how you can sustain the unexpected when you're surrounded by a lot of other forces which are trying to make everything very expected, whether they're commercial, state, or even musicians, conservatism, or whatever it might be. It seems to me how you sustain that dynamic is a really difficult issue. Yeah. Yeah, I, mean, I, I was stuck during, during, our, during our research that promoters would tell us time and time again that live music is the great unmediated experience, it's the definitive experience of music. When live music is actually more mediated than ever. I mean, some of the shows that Emma went to, with, you know, the amount of technology, the, the stuff that actually stands between the audience and the music is, is greater than ever at the time we're getting told that this is more real than ever. So there's a real kind of paradox there. I guess the, the kind of broader picture of, of, of live music, I'll bring you in a minute, Matthew, yeah, yeah, as I saw you yeah, yeah. um, is that, you know, we had, did have this kind of, sort of boom period where live music, um, its economic value exceeded that of recording. Uh, we're now, you know, being told that perhaps there's a little bit of a dip going on, there's festivals being cancelled, people are worried about um, spending cuts uh, from, from central government and so on, there's kind of economic downturn. But one of the, kind of, again, historically, one of the interesting things about Kenny's paper yesterday, he talked about the Apollo opening in Glasgow in 1973, at exactly the time of a kind of economic downturn and, you know, IRA bombing campaign, things were pretty kind of grim. But that would seem to be the ideal time to open a venue because people want to get away from all that shit and have a good time. So there's a kind of a power of Matthew, did you want to say something? And then I'll, I'll, yeah, I mean, it was, a, it was a question for Ben about a, a point that you made earlier, but what Simon was just talking about, kind of, in, in the sense of kind of marginalisation, sort of reminded me a bit, you know, you're talking about from a kind of technical media point of view, and actually, but it was, it was that sense of, you know, is there a kind of shift in the aesthetics of the live experience that, you know, bands now have to really kind of up their game in terms of entertainment value. And I think, you know, certainly some of what you're kind of saying there, there's kind of no room for surprise. So, you know, and it's very much about giving audiences a very particular kind of experience that, I don't know, maybe slightly less musical or... I think, it's, I think, I think it's a mix. I think some genres, it's kind of like you need to almost present a perfect, like you're talking about a perfect sound system and that kind of thing, venues. There is that want to listen and hear this, well, exactly what was on the CD. Like I, I've always been a lover of mistakes. I like going to gigs and watch uh, watch someone fall off stage mid mid guitar strum because it's it's something which you remember. Like you've got <laughs> the the points where they sort of go off. Especially on it. with you. You're obviously a fan of in, in, uh, uh, interpret and interpretation. Uh, jamming, but, you know, and I, when a band chooses to sort of go off. You know, off the road, and, and and that's to me is the exciting point. And I do think with the venues, the the making a a, a perfectly sounding venue. I just did a, a tour with the dancers in France, and we did three venues, two of which were state of the art, um, you know, brilliantly designed for sound to listen for the to support. The band came off stage completely flat because they they've had a very uh, not dull interaction, but when it, when the 
the, the, when it, it drops dead and you can't hear the, the, the sound reverberating at all off the walls because it's all kind of padded, you suddenly get the clap disappearing really quickly because when they're, they're, they're pulled into the band and you have the audience kind of going around speaking really quietly because they it just it's really strange environment compared to um, the last one which was an old theatre um, and, and it, it, to be honest it sounded horrible but it was a very exciting performance and a very exciting interaction between the band and audience and I do think you have to pay huge attention to, to that and I think that kind of creating the said in Glasgow that the venue which at a time like this where um, people are looking for a uh, it will ultimately have to be a cheap experience with, uh, uh, for an exciting evening. Um, I do think you have to pay attention to what that venue is and, and kind of represents both within the city. Um, and it's, it's, it's ultimately down to character and history, and I think, and it's something which people will get behind if, it, if they feel it's real and, um, and has, that, has that character. Does that answer that question? Nick, do you think it's a good time to be on the venue or a bad time to be on the venue? It's a bit of a strange one at the moment because the, there's a bit of a dip at the moment. There was a huge fascination in live music about five years ago, especially in live guitar-based music that really had a peak a few years ago. And we're sort of seeing a bit of a downturn on that where people are moving towards pop in the charts and things like dubstep and things like that and what's engaging a lot of the younger people. And at the same time, from a promoter point of view, when bands are coming through, both of you guys spoke about the tour support aspect of a record label and now the record labels don't have as much money because there isn't as much money to be made from pressing a record and selling it to people. They can't give as much support to a band and therefore it makes it harder on the touring promoter in terms of if I wanted to put on a band at the same level as maybe five years ago, yeah. it would cost me more because mm -hmm. their, their costs are a lot more. They'd either have to play, you know, lose money to play because of all their touring costs for vans, sound engineers, hotels, anything like that. Um, they have to pay that out of what they earn on the road. And there's a lot less money like going around to support that, I find. And that's what's making it kind of difficult. I mean, we, we do very, very well. And bands, as you say, play for the love of playing. It's that people are going to make music even if there's no money in it. Um, and I think it will hopefully, um, sort of probably off what Ben said as well, the struggling musicians, the people who've got more desire, will float to the top because they're doing it for the right reasons. In my, there's an interesting subtext to that from what you're saying about the French model and bands like wanting it more, but also the fact that the subways as well they were supported financially to go off and tour. Now, obviously, it didn't affect the subways; they've gone and done their things. But I, when Forward Russia were touring and we were sleeping on people's floors and we were doing everything we possibly can to try and make it work. There were bands in, from Leeds who were signed to major labels at the same time who were walking around with £150 a day, you know, sound, you know, get, sound engineers getting more money than we were taking home in fees, losing thousands of pounds on UK tours playing to half the audience who never had that drive to I go think, through with it all. And, I think, yeah, it think to answer that, you, it's right, and you're right. Uh, as so as an example, they toured for two years before they got no, here. Yeah. No, I, I, know, I know they don't count. I, I, know, I, know, <laughs> I know they don't count. And they, there's a lot, I know a lot of but, levels who've toured. And there, there isn't the money. You know, labels, labels change, they're doing 360 degree deals. They're trying to basically take life. And obviously, I'm sure you'll know all this like, uh, live and uh, <coughs> income alongside to try and create, to claw the money back to, to, to make these things possible. But I think, yeah, it's, it's becoming. It's, it is becoming harder to, to do that. They need to, need to find money to sustain it. But I do think there is a lot more to be said to the to, to that the change from say um, I don't know 15 20 years ago when you did have you had a million pounds to spend from a major label on just doing a video and it, you know, the reissuing CDs and uh, digital remastered versions to bring in huge amounts of income to make the record companies as fat as the fat and spend ridiculous amounts of money on bands which really aren't ever going to make it. I do think there's that ability now for a band to do a lot more themselves, to, 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 to put themselves out on the internet, to go to a live audience. I think one of my, one of my most interesting examples is my friend who uh, used to do open mic sessions in, in London and he did a, uh, he just go, you know, we'd, we'd hang out, we did up, up all night open mic sessions 
we twinned it with new, uh, with this lot in New York and ran it off of a sort of anti-folk um, sort of mm. sessions and that kind of stuff. It was ridiculous. But he, he was kind of the star. He was the star, but he never got looked at he didn't, in, in the UK. He never got touched. And he, one day, through a, a system online, put his name down on this thing, which said, if you want me to come and gig in your town, you know, vote for, you know, vote for me, let me know if you can be able to set something up. He got an answer from Toulouse and uh, Vienna um, that there was kids there who wanted to book him and having heard his music. So he went off and he did 50 people in Toulouse, 50 people in Vienna. He then moved to Vienna and started gigging in Vienna as, a, as an artist and then got picked up by a record label and is now a successful musician within Vienna. I think it's trying to find those, you know, it, it's, there's, it's now international, it's become mm -hmm. kind of international. Um, it's, you're, the music which people are playing and performing is incredibly varied um, and it's trying to find your, trying to locate where your audience is and the most important place for that is, is, on, is online and will be, continue to be online um, in the future. There is, there's a, certainly for me I've always wanted, as I always wanted to start a venue, I'm envious of these guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, done, you know, I, I like, like the idea of create, uh, creating a community and, and bringing up uh, a, a music scene within a, a town and making a centre for for some for for uh, uh, people, musicians to gather and talk and exchange ideas. And I do in London, it felt it always felt quite negative. You always had bands playing with each other who didn't listen to each other, and I never understood it really. Mm -hmm. They'd all come along, they'd sound they'd sound check one after the other. As a promoter, I sort of booked, I booked you know, twenty pounds a week in in London across various venues because it's just. You had to do that to make money because there's such competition. Um, but they never, they never really kind of communicated and shared ideas. I remember going to New York for the first time and watching an unsigned band night, and all the bands were playing in each other's bands. Like they had a drummer playing with another band, a bassist playing with another band. But I, I do think that's changed because I do think Leeds was a bit like that and it changed that way. And then when you've had in London, you know, the Nambuka scene, and now you've got the communion scene and people like that, it seems to be growing more yeah, generally. Yeah. You know, I'd agree and I think it should be encouraged as much mm. as possible. Well, I think it's time we should open it up to the audience for any questions or comments, uh, so, uh, perhaps for particular members of the panel. But, um, if you did, Matt, what did you? Um, yeah, I guess I had just had a question um, about this notion of building a live, what you brought up, um, which is about uh, building a digital fan base versus building a live fan base, and where a young band should be putting their efforts and how mutually exclusive those two things are. And I was also thinking of, your, of yourself, Ben, uh, speaking, you know, you've talked a bit about the subways and, and a bit about the dancers. I don't know if you're trying to get the dancers to break in, in the UK just yet, but you have this other band, the Young Aviators, and how, from that perspective, what the, um, what the challenges are, whether, you know, there's, there's obviously been, uh, a discourse that's emerged in the last five years of you know live is where everyone should be you know putting putting their resources, especially young artists, learn to you know uh, to be engaging live. But then there's this you know this this kind of digital investment thing that you're you're talking about, and um, and you seem to imply that there might be more exciting things happening um, online that were separate from. And I was just wondering if you could tease that out a little bit in, in terms of, from the perspective of, of trying to grow a fan base, either digitally or as a live audience for, uh, you know, for a band that would, to move on to the next uh, stage. I mean, I mean, in terms of the balance, I, the, the answer is I'm still trying to work that out. <laughs> I think, I don't, it really is, the question. Yeah, it really, it is the magic question a little bit, and, and I don't know. I think, I think the important thing, and we, because the, the young conference that I organised yesterday over the road, a lot of that focus was on digital and and kind of making the most out of your your presence digitally. And one of the things I'm interested in is just the way people are consuming music digitally. You know, going back to the kind of dubstep on phones kind of idea. You know, that's how people are listening to that scene a lot of the time. But <clears throat> I mean, the one thing that came out of yesterday for us was 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 almost you know look at how much you can do and try and do it. You know, in terms of social connectivity online and everything like that. One of the interesting things that I've looked at is is actually 
you, you were saying about them being separate, but really it, it's about how you can get them to feed into each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, and like one specific thing, there's a there's a guy called Darren Hemmings who uh, is a digital marketing manager doing some fascinating stuff. And one of the, just one example of what he's been doing is one of the projects he's worked with for a band is to have a Twitter map where you can tweet your artifacts from a gig, photos, comments, and the hashtag and geolocation that you have within Twitter can map them onto a band's website so that you can then digitally interact with people at the gig at the same time or go back and, <coughs> you know, experience the gig through other people through their digital medium. And obviously that's... That's that and that's that, but that's a way where you can kind of enhance the, it's the connectivity with your fan, and this is kind of a very sort of fan and marketing sort of side of it, I, I guess, but that's a way where you can make the fans feel close to the band and close to the experiences of the band, but without it being live. But you need the live element to be there as well, you know, the live show needs to be worth people coming to, but that's then how you kind of make people connect more with it, perhaps, in the digital sphere. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else want to comment on it? I, 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 my, I think with my experience it's different from, for different bands. Like it's, it's different for different artists in terms of what works. Like for, for dubstep and type phone, uh, being on mobile phones and stuff, I don't see you looking for working for a hardcore band or a. a, a no, 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 sure. So it's, it's, it's really um, just identifying what, what you, who you're trying to get to and who you're trying to be. I think there's a lot, there's a huge kind of uh, new metal um, brand which is based around obviously the, 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 the clothes that. The look, as, as as well as the sound, and, and identifying with with the uh, the right places is kind of what you need to achieve. In terms of digital ideas, uh, we did uh, pledge music on the last album, which was a really good concept in terms of pre uh, identifying to the to uh, get the <coughs> base involved for a long time. I think the old concept of um, you know, people, but labels talk about impact dates now in terms of the releases of, uh, of an album, more, more so than singles, I suppose. And uh, it's, it's kind of trying to keep your fan base interested over a, a long period of time seems to be the, the, you know, the way to do it, and that is through obviously on uh, Facebook and all that, doing all those kind of things. But trying to find new things like pledge music where you can constantly update with it, things which artists don't haven't previously uh, released to, to, to the public, such like behind the scenes the making of the song, we had kids coming in and singing with the, with the uh, band on the album. There was, there was some bands who were taking the bands to, to the zoo for the day or inviting them around for Christmas dinner, but there's, there's, a, there's a certain level and it depends what works with what, with, with, with what act. On the flip side of that, I'd say there's a huge argument towards hiding everything. And sort of just say, just saying, okay, we're good. we're not actually going to be on anywhere. I think there's a that uh, want from the public to, to have something which they can't actually access, and that will if you do that, then you just let out a tiny bit at a time, but you gather interest and instead of being present online the entire time, people want a bit of entry. And then the interesting about that, so that last point is it's hiding what you don't want them to have, but you can give them sneak peeks of what you don't want them to have to the interest as well. I, there's a band from Leeds who are, who are like, you know, digital policy is, is nothing, yeah. but they obviously put enough online to make you interested. They need in to tell them people that the digital policy is nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Did you want to come in? Well, that, that seems to be coming up a, a lot when, as part of my role, I'll write press releases and things for gigs that I'm putting on, and sometimes if the artist can't send you a vibe or anything like that, then you sort of have to hunt around online to find it. And interestingly, you'll find a band who, uh, I've got a band playing on Monday, a girl called Louis, goes by the name Louise and the Pins, and she's been writing with Laura Marling, and was taught support for Laura Marling, and has done a lot of things like that, so quite established in the folk scene. But if you type her name in on the internet, she's, she doesn't have a record label or anything listed, but there's clearly a management thing going on behind the scenes, because it is almost impossible to find any information about her online because clearly whatever she's done up to this point has been different or not what they want to be portrayed of the artist and it's all been removed from the internet and that's mentoring perception which yeah, is it is, yeah. Yeah. because there's something which they want to build that's different to that um, and the only real article I've ever considering she was the tour support for Laura Marling for like a year and a half uh, the only information I found in terms of interview or anything like that was an interview from 2009 on a folk blog which probably got missed, and that's the only reason that it's still up there. Um, and I think it very much, from a management and a label point of view, affects 
how people are perceived. There's a band who have been coming through in Leeds recently, which Whiskers has worked with as well, called Elm and the Escapades. And they won the Glastonbury Unsigned competition, the same as the Subways did, and that elevated them very quickly to a, a position where agents and managers and record labels were interested in them. And they sort of had this product where they were this very interesting young folk band who wrote pop songs. Um, and everyone wanted a piece of them. But a lot of the feedback which they got constantly was not that there was anything wrong with the songs, their image, anything like that. They, you know, they had it all, but they didn't have enough fans on Facebook. <coughs> it was something which came back to them an awful lot. And a lot of labels said to them, well, go out there and establish yourselves, play live, or you know, do whatever you have to do and come back to us when you have more fans on Facebook and followers on Twitter. And it was bizarre because that stopped them getting decent record deals in a few places. But then they went and released the record themselves by going on pledge. And in the same way that record labels didn't perceive that they had many fans online, uh, they did a pledge campaign to raise the money for their album and raised the 100% of the total in four days mm. when you have three months usually mm. to do it. My advice was always if, if the record labels weren't wanting to sign them and you said they, they didn't get decent record label deals, they probably weren't decent record deals. With, yeah, with yeah, people yeah. That they were doing. yeah oh, completely. Yeah. It's yeah. an awful way to to side a band. <laughs> you can't be in love with a band. Do you? But that's how the mainstreams operate. So a lot of yeah. what we're talking about in terms of the digital media strategies, you know, people like Darren Evans is Radio One Player that's been dictated by YouTube play increase of YouTube plays and Facebook likes. You know, that's mm. how the mainstream is operating now. But there is a choice through. now to, to divert that I think to to, to you know go around it. Mm. You know? um, I think I think we're getting to the uh, we are very serious, um, and I think we will, we'll, we'll have time for further comments after the uh, end of the next panel. But um, just an anecdote that comes out of the kind of rewriting of the history thing. Um, somebody who made a video for Matt's band, I, I know, had a job recently where his job was to edit out a former member of the band from all the videos that were going into a compilation <laughs> for a very well known band. So the, the, the basis doesn't exist officially, the X basis no longer exists. But I would really like to thank uh, everyone on the panel Whiskers, Ben, uh, Nick, and Simon, uh, which I think has been a really interesting panel. Um, so thanks very much folks.